Hello, I'm Jessica Lyley and welcome back to Aussie Wristwatch where I talk about watches and why I love them so much. Before we get started today on our historic journey of Panerai, please do me a favor if you, well, actually, no, you probably haven't already, hit the like button uh, for me on this video because that's going to help me big time with the good old algorithm that is YouTube. And if you have not already subscribed, please hit the subscribe back button and please come back again. I talk reviews, I talk history and famous watches and anything else in between. The aim of the game is to not take myself seriously. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> and to have a little bit of fun in the process and for me to learn something about watches. So today we are going to talk about the history of the Italian, Italian watchmaker Panerai. That's it. Now Swiss made, but Italian in origin. Okay. A fish, a fish in Panerai, 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 was established in Florence in 1860. Ah, one year before the formation of the modern Italian state. I did not know that. At the time, its founder Giovanni Panerai established an office combining the functions of a watchmaking school, a repair workshop, and a sales showroom. Eventually, assuming the name, I cannot even pronounce this, Orogivera Schiveria, Schivera, the company soon became an influential point for sale for Swiss watchmakers. The late 19th century saw Panerai enter a transitional period under Giovanni and his son, Leon Francesco. Father and son worked with recognised watch industry leaders from the Swiss Orology Heartland to establish supply ties that became the basis for the Italian firm's sales growth and eventual watch production model. Movement cases and specialised parts, the entire watches travelled from Swiss specialists to Panerai's offices as needed. Under Leon Francesco's guidance, Panerai diversified to become a research and development operation with core competencies in mechanical engineering, component fabrication and instrument design. From the 1900s, by the turn of the century, Giovanni's grandson Guido had established the firm, then known as Guido, Panerai and Filio, as an official supplier of the Regia Marina, the Royal Italian Navy. Initially, the contracts focused on the company's burgeoning capabilities as a diversified design bureau. Timing and contact triggers for mines, submersible navigation tools and mechanic Mechanicized computing devices represented the bulk of Panerai's early military contracts. <clears throat> Critically, the turn of the 20th century also set Panerai on a convergence course with the military watchmaking identity for which it became legendary. Between 1915 and 1916, Panerai worked to develop a self-sustaining source of illumination for the military equipment that was becoming central to the firm's business model. Marie and Pierre Curie's 1898 discovery of radium had opened a new field of technology designed to harness the gamma emissions of the new element. Panerai's proprietary radium compound composed of zinc sulfide, radium bromide and mesothorium was trademarked as Radiomere. Now, waterproof watches on a parallel plane to the watch industry, one of Panerai's Swiss manufacturing partners, Rolex, was making its name in the waterproof watch sector. You may recall my little video about Mercedes and the English Channel. Please go back to it if you haven't. In 1926, the development of the Oyster case became a defining moment in the history of the watch industry. Previously waterproof, today known as water resistant, watches were unreliable, awkwardly packaged and economically impractical. With the development of Rolex's Oyster, waterproof watches became a practical proposition for consumer pocket and wrist models. The arrival of waterproof watches also created a new sales proposition for one of Panerai's largest patrons, the Italian military. Italy's World War I success with combat swimmers combined, combined sorry, with interwar development 
of the Davis Rebreather, a pioneering portable underwater breathing device to spawn a new class of maritime combatant, the underwater demolition specialist, or famously the Frogman. Waterproof timers were essential to the success of the new concept. And in Radio Mio and with the Rolex Oyster, Panerai held both keys to the Reggia Marina's puzzle. Watchers of the Italian Navy. By the mid-1930s, discussions between Panerai and Italian naval authorities had reached a critical mass. World War II was beginning to loom on the horizon. The Italian deployments to North Africa accelerated the military timetables for their delivery. And working with Rolex in Geneva, Panerai arranged for delivery of fully assembled reference 2533 oyster cased pocket watches, complete with movements. By special consent of the Swiss firm, Panerai was permitted to modify the cases, movements and dials to suit the demands of the military. Between 1936 and 38, the Panerai Rolex and Italian authorities collaborated and refined the model, which would become the definitive Panerai military to watch. The 3646, between 1938 to 56, these watches formed the backbone of Panerai's deliveries to the Italian Navy. All of the Panerai watches were assembled by Rolex and Panerai's Italian office modified them to suit the military requirements. Soldered on wire lugs, so, soldered, sorry, on wire lugged wax leather straps, high visibility dials with two piece sandwich construction and large bezels and a shatter resistant crystal composed of a revolutionary thermoplastic compound plexiglass became the signature contributions of the Italian contractor. World War II was the crucible in which Panerai Watch's military legacy and combat heritage were forged. The Italian amphibious commandos having been consolidated under the unit banner, the Sima Flottlia Mezzi da Sarto, mate, uh, my Italian is shocking, <laughs> Went to war equipped with Panerai watches and instruments. Combat operations were manned torpedoes, mines and explosive speedboats succeeded in sinking allied combat and transfer craft in the Mediterranean theatre. Panerai's distinctive combat watches accompanied all the Decima personnel. Yep, that's right. Our enemy wore these cool watches, but let's just forget about that for now. Both the Panerai Tom pieces and Italian Frogman became influential in elite circles of the tactical nature. The German Navy adopted the Panerai. They dubbed it the Kampfschwimmer. That's also going to be wrong, but it's going to be close. As the timekeeper of choice for its own elite amphibious units. Understandably unable to source the Panerai of choice for its own, own work, the British Admiralty nevertheless worked to emulate the Italian Gamma Swimmers and their Panerai dive watches. Interesting, hey? They say imitation is the best form of um, compliment. Look, between the outbreak of the war in Europe and then the frost of the Cold War in the 50s, Panerai produced a limited number of watches. They gradually dovetailed and the end of its military relationship with the groundwork of its eventual consumer success. During this period, the company continued to experiment with new lug designs, new cases, new models, new forms and locking crowns and new chemical compounds for its signature illumination. Probably because the radium air was radioactive and uh, toxic, probably had something to do with it. Now, the new, the new luminescent chemistry was based on beta ray emitter tritium, debuted in 1949, and the material was notable for its name as its composition. They trademarked the substance luminol, which we know today, and that would live on uh, as the phrase. And it's important to note until the consumer era, the names radium era and luminol exclusively referred to luminescent Paint compounds, not designs. <laughs> I love that because I had no idea. Look, in the 2000s, between 97 to 2014, every feature present in the Panerai customer base and product line emerged. 
Panerai was the first watch brand to benefit from the promotional power of the internet. While the company's official web presence was merely part of its industry, it was the third party and user generated content that drove the company's online buzz. Who would have thought? Websites and web forums engaged as the local focal points for collector interest in the Panerai products, model availability and heritage of tactical exploits. Pioneering watch community sites, led by the year 2000 launch of the Panaristi.com, networked a fan base that amounted to several thousand individuals spread globally. <laughs> but their online ranks swelled and the self-described Panaristi became the brand's best salesman, or as I would like to hope, salespeople. One year before Wikipedia's debut, five years before YouTube flickered to life and five years before the first Reddit, Panerai fan forums led by Panaristi.com had become a virtual prototype for the dawning social internet movement. How cool is that? I actually didn't know any of this. Online users communicated via Vendum and its agent. And Panerai's appeal lay in its historic ties to special forces, application-driven design, and unprepossessed image. Wearing a Panerai was like owning a momentum of an adventure. Buyers who were leery of extravagant accessories appreciated the practical rationale behind the Luminor standout size, the unpretentious image of a blue-collar working watch, firewalled the Italian brand from the baggage occasionally associated with other upscale watch labels. And Richemont were happy to play along. From an initial 93 to 97 pre vidome consumer run, estimated at less than 2,000 watches, Richemont accelerated Panerai's production to over 70,000 annual units by 2013. In the intervening period, Panerai passed multiple milestones that continued its progression from military contractor to cult product to mainstream player. Under Richemont, Panerai's product focus remains robust and it remains innovative. Frequent limited editions highlight significant models, calibers and episodes in the company's history. Panerai packaging and supporting documents, documents sorry, pioneered the concept of correlation, whereby each authenticating document relies to extend on another within the set. Richmond's early decision to include standard strap changing tools and auxiliary straps enabled a budding accessory strap subculture to flourish within the Panerai owner community, of which I am one of them. I love the fact that I can easily change my straps. Subsequent model releases capitalised on this trend, incorporating quick release lugs. Yeah. As a pedigree and prices of Panerai pieces grew in magnitude, so did the model lineup. As early as 97, the limited reissue of a model based on the template of Panerai pre-war workhorse received enthusiastic response from collectors. Panerai developed a second model line, the Radiomere, based on the case shape and crown layout of the Panerai 3646 military model, and the Radiomere joined the Luminor as the second pillar of the modern Panerai product catalogue. Of course, we also have the Submersible now, and we also have the Panerai Luminor Due, which has been, I think, marketed more to a female wearer or someone with a smaller wrist size who doesn't want as chunky a watch. I mean, the brand Panerai is steeped in history and the military and the naval aspect of that appeals to me greatly as someone who many years ago was a Navy cadet and wanted to join the Navy. I think it's one of the reasons I love these watches so much, just the affinity with the Navy, even if it was a Navy that was fighting against us at the time, it doesn't matter, like at the end of the day, the innovation that came from the iterations of those watches, I think is astounding. And to have marketed that into a successful brand and to have embraced the social internet in that way, I think is fascinating. I love these watches. I love that history. I love the history of most watches that have a story like that. But for me, this one holds a special place. 
And I hope you've enjoyed the story too, as much as I enjoyed telling it. Uh, please hit the like button and please remember to subscribe to the channel for me and keep coming back for reviews, more history, famous watches, and don't forget to comment below and let's have a conversation. Thanks guys, until next time.